now I just want to call on stage the new uh, round of people and then I will introduce you. So Jakob Lillemose, Ingrid Barrington, Helga Tawilsori, uh, Gabriele Asbesto Zaverio, and somebody else I'm missing? No. Ingrid Barrington, yes. Great. And so this panel has a really interesting title, Cable Breaks, the power below the surface. And uh, I'm really happy now to introduce uh, uh, something that goes a bit more into the political aspect of our, our discussion. And uh, also our moderator, Jacob Lillemose. So first of all, I would like to ask you to make uh, an applause to them because I think it's really great crowd. <laughs> And with Jacob, I had already the pleasure to work uh, for uh, some years at Transmediale Festival, and he's working at the Copenhagen Center of Re Disaster Research. And uh, also was really interesting the kind of uh, collaboration that we have in organizing this panel, and I think you are going to speak more about that. And by the way, also Jacob is a great curator, expert of network art, of zombie culture, <laughs> of uh, really a lot of interesting subjects since the early net art time. And so we know each other also for a really long time. We have been collaborating for various projects already at the Transmediale Festival. And at the moment he's working as postdoc in art and cultural studies um, in the cultural history uh, no, in the cultural history of disasters at the Copenhagen Center for Disaster Research. So there is a lot of disaster <laughs> in these kind of sentences, and I think he also will tell you more about that. And so he was uh, uh, the exhibition curator at Transmediale Festival in 2012 and 2013 and uh, received in 2011 a PhD from the Institute of Arts and Cultural Studies at the University of Copenhagen. And as I say, he has been working uh, since a uh, really long time on the discourse of net art and software art since the mid-90s, organizing a really interesting exhibition in Copenhagen uh, in, in international environment and uh, is part of the Danish Net Art Collective Art Node, uh, Independent Research Center for Digital Art and Culture. And uh, I just want to say a little background <laughs> of how we come uh, up with this idea of the cable breaks, because I think it's interesting. And then you will tell more, of course. Uh, I mean, since he's working at the Copenhagen um, the, Disaster Research Center, we were really thinking uh, on the idea of uh, investigative uh, cable breaks and also the end of the internet. That was really tough to en enter into this subject. And then uh, slowly on our research, this panel tur in turned into the discourse of digital divides. So I don't want to anticipate too much now because you will speak uh, more in depth. But what you will also hear will be a really diverse perspective from different countries and different points of view, also on the discourse of the breaks of connectivity and the digital divide and the political surface uh, below, or actually below the surface of the internet. So thanks a lot, uh, Jakob. Now I leave the word to you and you will introduce uh, the speakers. And also I want to thank uh, the NOME Gallery for uh, the cooperation on this specific panel because Ingrid Barrington will be the one of the next artists at the gallery here in Berlin, opening a show uh, in September. So uh, there is another partnership going on in the creation of these events, and Ingrid also will say something about that. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, uh, Tatiana, for this much too generous uh, introduction. Um, it's really great to be here uh, and uh, to be able to continue our collaboration. Th there's no image on this slide, just in case. Um, I think you're doing uh, amazing work here with the Disruption uh, Network Lab. Oh, low battery, hang on a second.
Uh, no, and, and thanks for letting me host this uh, panel. I, I guess I'm, I'm really, really honored and, and looking forward to hear our three uh, great speakers, Enric Bergenson, uh, Gabriel Aspesto Severio, and Helga Tawilsuri. I hope I pronounced the names correctly. Okay. <laughs> okay, but, but that said, I, I have to say that I feel like I'm a little bit, I'm, I'm like I'm the odd one out here. Um, I mean, as Tatiana said, I've done some work on, on the internet, both as an academic and as a curator, but uh, I've never been to a, a, a manhole or anything like that, so I'm, I can't really say I'm an expert on the internet. Um, but, but I remember, actually, uh, when Henrik's uh, radio piece came out on, on, on the physicality of the internet, I, I was immediately struck and I connected it to the work that I'm, that I'm doing at the uh, at, at the Copenhagen Center for Disaster Research, which is looking at disasters and, and how these are reflected in art and popular culture. And the research is basically that I'm running this, well, apart from taking, uh, how do you say, part in an ongoing research into disasters across disciplines, speaking with lawyers, speaking with economists, speaking with anthropologists, even theologists about disaster in contemporary society and how it shapes society. I run my own little uh, space in Copenhagen called X and Beyond, um, which is just a way of, of getting to uh, get involving uh, how art really uh, engages with with disasters. Um, and and I, I guess my, my contribution is also like all the others is to develop what we call um, advanced um, disaster literacy. So uh, really creating a vocabulary for people to grasp what a contemporary disaster is, because uh, it's a really complex uh, phenomenon. I think we can all agree on that. Um, so one, one part of my research in, includes technological disasters, which has a long history and, and an actuality, uh, like the Fukushima Daiichi power plant in Japan, who is now it's five years ago, and this is also uh, 20 years of the Chernobyl disaster, so there's two anniversaries of, of major technological disasters uh, to look at. And these, both these uh, phenomena has been uh, reflected in art. Um, uh, Trevor Paiklin, who was here yesterday, is involved in a project right now in the, uh, in the exclusion zone around uh, the Fukushima Daiichi plant, uh, an exhibition that will only open the moment that the exclusion zone is no longer there. Um, Another example is this one, the, the Day the Earth Caught Fire, which was a film I showed. It's basically a nuclear war that uh, brings the Earth out of its course towards the sun until it burns up. And this was part of a, a project I, I curated called the Atomic Age Revisited. So looking at how, what's the, the disaster scenario of atomic power and nuclear power today. And this will uh, culminate in a in an exhibition I'm doing in, in January about works uh, dealing with the Fukushima uh, disaster. Um, but what about the disaster imaginary of the internet? Um, you have something like Snow Crash uh, from Neil Stevenson uh, when the internet was really young. Um, but, but what about today uh, when with all the knowledge we've uh, obtained about the physical infrastructure of the internet. Uh, that, that's something I really, I guess, sparked the idea of, of doing this conference with, with Tatjana. Um, so just, just a few looks at, at what, what is the, the common, like some, some disaster uh, scenarios of the internet. So here's one you probably all know, uh, Transcendence, the movie with Johnny Depp, where it's kind of the internet turns into this singularity. Uh, it's kind of a traditional idea of, of technology taking over. That is also, yeah, you can see that in the, uh, what's it called? Um, the Arnold Schwarzenegger film, um, Terminator films. But then you, of course, have something like this. This is an image we've seen many times. It's actually a reenactment of this scene from Jaws 2, 1978. So I don't know if this is actually an internet cable that the shark is biting into. It manages to bite into the cable, but then it dies. From, from the explosion. Um, but as we've always, as we've heard, it takes more than uh, one shark or one squirrel <laughs> to bring down the internet. It probably takes something like this, a, sh a Sharknado, to really 
destroy all the buildings we've, we've heard about, um, if, if that's uh, a scenario we want to buy into. Um, so, but but then that said, it was really what I became interested in is the internet as a vulnerable uh, structure, a vulnerable infrastructure. Um, and um, how resilient is it to breakdowns? Because um, I think that's what the history of technological disasters prove is that however um, strong and resilient you build a structure, there's always a failure at some point. There's always a risk. Uh, so, so I got this idea, like what if the disaster is not how the internet works, but that it's not working? And, and then is this reflected in art? Uh, would, would be something I would be really interested in looking at. And, I mean, Andrew already showed this episode from South Park, so I won't go over this, but I think it's, it's really a, a, a great piece of, of showing like the social uh, repercussions of the internet going down, like people become totally desperate and Stan's family goes out west where they heard there's still some internet left, basically because the father wants to look at porn <laughs> uh, or, and some other stuff. But then the, the idea here, I think, is like the, it's the reenactment of this pioneer movement of going out west, uh, but not, not to in any kind of religious uh, drive, but a kind of a technological desire. Um, so, but this humor and pulp aside, I think this points to the fact that, that the infinite has a, has a really material structure and that structure um, is vulnerable to the contingencies and, and sometimes the strange laws of, of, of the physical world. And I got to think about uh, one technology that has come to an end or is very close to coming to an end, uh, which is penic penicillin, uh, who is, is, is really like due to its own success is becoming radically, rapidly uh, ineffective because the bacteria are developing resistance. Sorry. Sorry. Okay, as I was saying, okay, you, you got the part where this Sharknado, you got that South Park, um, pulp and humor aside. No, I wanted to get to this because I think that's really, uh, that's, that's one of the idea of, of technology's ending. I think that's really something that sparks my um, imagination as, as a curator and, and a person interested in, in art. Um, that, that, that is actually a technology that will someday come to an end. Uh, and actually because of its own success, I think that this example is, is something I'm really curious and scared to see how, what the consequences will be of this, the end of, of this technology. But okay, but before we get uh, caught up in this uh, speculative end game of technology, which has a lot of uh, romantic and dystopian uh, pitfalls, I think the challenge is really to, to charge the material condition of the internet with, with uh, both inventive and critical thinking of art and research. And I'm, that's why I'm so happy that the three people on the panel here, I'm sure they can uh, say a lot about that and I will stop now and give the words to them because they are much more knowledgeable about uh, this than I am. I'm really happy you're here and uh, looking forward to, to uh, hear what you have to say. So I, I, what I'll do is I'll, I won't introduce you all in detail at once. I'll do it before each talk. Uh, do you want this? Uh, here you go. So first speaker is Ingrid Bergenton. She's an artist living in New York, where she is a fellow at the Data and Society Research Institute, working with surveillance geography, data centers, and network infrastructure. Her projects include essays written for Creative Time, reports, and waging nonviolence about an official park next to the NSA and the data center landscape of Northern Virginia. As a resident at IBEAM Art and Technology Center, she created Seeing Networks, which is a field guide to the internet infrastructure in New York City. And she has been writing for The Atlantic about uh, data centers, geopolitics of the international cloud and cable infrastructure. One of her mapping projects is submarine cable taps from 2014. Um, you're getting the whole, I, I can't do a short one after Tachana gave me such a long one. Because you, you are the, really the, the focus here. Uh, the submarine cable taps from 2014 created to better understand what the reach of the GCHQ submarine cable tapping might look like. And then I should add again, you have an upcoming show at uh, the Nomi Projects in September. Welcome, and here's the microphone. Oh, thank you. That was good. <laughs> I feel, 
I feel like I sent you a three-sentence bio. I don't know how you did that. That's, that's amazing. Thank you. Um, and thank you so much, um, everyone, for coming. And thank you um, to the Disruption Lab for, for inviting me. Um, it's really humbling to be among such a kind of awesome, esteemed group of, of experts. Um, so this photo is um, of an old coaxial cable sticking out of a, a sea cliff, and it's um, I don't know for sure, but I'm pretty sure it's the HAW4 uh, cable that used to connect Point Arena or Manchester, California to Hawaii. Um, I'm going to mostly be talking about um, Manchester and Point Arena, and I kind of will use them interchangeably, partly because they're, they're two towns in rural northern California that are very close to each other. Manchester is the one that has the submarine cable. Point Arena is, for a long time, the cable was actually called the Point Arena Cable Station for like obscure geographic regions that it might not be worth getting into in 20 minutes. Um, and it's interesting, I don't know, the, this particular cable landing site came up um, in yesterday's panels because uh, this is the site that was in the ProPublica and New York Times reporting about um, AT&T's complicity in NSA spying. Um, this was kind of a key piece of evidence in, in making those arguments. And I'm not really going to be talking about that at all. I have a kind of different uh, relationship to this area um, and to kind of the stories of it. And I don't know, I really appreciated one of the points that uh, Moritz made yesterday um, during his presentation about just sort of the importance of the people behind the internet. And I think there is sometimes a risk as much as um, a lot of the previous speakers have I've really enjoyed seeing their various sort of like bizarre road trip photographs of manhole covers. There is sort of a danger of sort of fetishizing the monoliths of the network and, and kind of losing sight of the human beings and sort of consequences that, that connect those, those monoliths to us. Um, this is a quote from Donna Haraway from 1988, as long as we're just felt like I should infuse a little bit of like cyber feminist uh, rhetoric into, into the day's proceedings. Um, and I think getting into kind of the particulars of this one site hopefully will be useful um, for kind of introducing some new questions. Um, so I first kind of got into the Manchester Cable Station because of finding this weird old telecom zine in the Prelinger archives in San Francisco, California. Um, the, the DEF CON 3 review is about as thrilling as it sounds. Um, but this particular magazine, I really enjoyed the fact that it had this feature spread on the Point Arena cable station, circa 1995. It's actually an excerpt from a internal newsletter that AT&T used to run for global cable station operators um, called Castanet. And it's, it's this really beautiful little portrait of day-to-day -day life in the cable station back in the day. And there's this, you know, the photographs actually on the, that are in that spread kind of haven't actually changed all that much in the time since, um, like, it was initially published, like the town and the roads and the, you know, Pirate's Cove bar pretty much look the same. Um, and there are a lot of mentions in that article about sort of the engagement of the people who worked at the cable station with the town, with the community, kind of like being involved in stuff like coaching like high school sports teams, things like that. It's, it's kind of quaint. Um, and this is what the uh, out exterior of that cable station looked like in 1995, and this is what it looks like today. So you can see there's kind of a bit more security theater that's sort of been imbued with the barbed wire and the sort of like shrubbery as obfuscation technique um, that I guess a lot of, I don't know, I feel like I run into that a lot looking at data centers and, and network infrastructure, that like if we just build high enough piles of flowers, no one will notice anything. Um, so I ended up through some weird coincidences um, becoming, developing some connections and relationships to people not directly in Manchester but in nearby Point Arena. Um, side note, the reason actually that there is this, this cable that connects um, the United States to Japan and Hawaii in this particular location is that Point Arena is the closest place along the kind of like lower 48 of the United States from like to Hawaii. Um, basically, it's like literally a line of best fit. They could run the shortest distance of cable to connect those two places and so it became a landing site in 1957. Um, but so I came there a few times over the last year and spent about a week there last fall with a collaborator of mine, Surya Matu, um, working and workshopping some material we've been developing for the last 
year or so um, of educational material about teaching primarily children about internet infrastructure. Um, and this is the website with some of the lesson plans and stuff we've been working on, if that's of any interest to anyone. And um, I guess kind of the motivation for doing this work emerged for both Surrey and I um, out of frustration with what in the United States, I don't know what it would be called here, is, is known as like digital literacy education. Um, generally when young people, um, when people are taught about using the internet or interfacing with the network, they're, they're often either taught sort of how to be like productive consumers of information, right? So, you know, here's a browser, here's how to use it. Um, here's how to get an email account, here's what cookies are. Or they're, you know, potentially taught how to, if they're taught something along the lines of more code-based literacy, they're, they're taught how to be sort of productive and legible actors who can get a job at Google. Um, and there's very little of the physical world or kind of the like really nitty gritty, you know, kind of protocol level stuff, which is a little bit more serious domain than mine. Um, and we, I don't know, we wanted to try and introduce some new kind of like approaches to teaching things about the internet, spe specifically like with really analog techniques. And we decided to go to Point Arena and spend a week working with um, an organization called the Point Arena Technology Center, which is run by this really great local activist, Blake Moore, uh, to work with kids. And I'm gonna show you a little bit of some of what we did just because it's super cute. Um, so we went on a lot of field expeditions. So all of the, the previous talks of the last two days of pointing at manholes and things, we, we forced children to do that. Um, and <laughs> Basically, this is us walking to see a microwave antenna on top of the, the local high school. Um, and then we had these little like workbooks that they were supposed to sort of take notes about different infrastructure they found and go home and take pictures of the routers in their houses. Um, we also have this um, sort of crude network topology modeling kit um, that was made in collaboration with Sam Cronick and Tara Shee, who are really great designers based in Oakland, California. And the idea is you know, fairly simple. You have these little modular blocks that you can interchange with sort of different images of infrastructure. Um, we try to use, when we do these workshops, we use like kind of images of things that are in the local vicinity so that you know, the, the kids can kind of understand like, oh, I know what that is, I've seen that before, and then try and kind of create these low level network models of how, you know, a message gets from like their computer to their friend's computer. Um, this is a photo of, of Surya somehow convincing seven-year-olds that a fiber optic cable is really, really interesting. Um, it's probably one of my favorite like photographs in existence. Um, he's like, there's light in there. It's so cute. Um, so we came to Point Arena for a few reasons. Um, we came there because we knew people. We came there because the submarine cable is a really useful thing to kind of like point at and like blows the minds of children. Um, but one of the big reasons we came there was that we really wanted to prototype this material with um, participants who were not really inundated with digital culture or ac or like really the internet at large. You know, doing this stuff like I live in New York, like half the kids in Park Slope already have smartphones. So it's not really like, they, they, a lot of the stuff is like they have a very, they, they already have a lot of assumptions about how the systems work. And so we wanted to work with kids who maybe didn't have that much exposure because Point Arena, despite being right next to this major choke point of global communications, has historically had really terrible internet access. Um, I wrote an article about this uh, last year and I, I remember joking with my editor about like the like cheap headline we could have done, which was like this one weird trick for avoiding NSA surveillance, live next to the NSA surveillance choke point. Um, we didn't use that because we, we have some taste. Um, <laughs> and the reason that this is not a, an entirely unusual sort of narrative, the idea that a place that would be right next to a bunch of fiber wouldn't have access to a lot of that fiber. And there are a lot of reasons why this happens. The main one kind of given in this context is return on investment, right? Um, so it's very expensive to build out cable infrastructure in general. And the idea of kind of creating these diversions to serve populations like the towns along this part of the Cal Northern California coast, you're about three hours north of San Francisco, they're all populations of you know less than a thousand 
the, the primary industries are tourism and weed. There's, there's not really, there's not a sense of like a massive market incentive to serve these, these communities, despite the fact that they're literally right there. Um, this is from the uh, 2000 article from the, the local town paper, the Independent Coast Observer, from a, a hearing about basically when Williams Communications, which is now part of level three communications, um, was doing new trenching um, to the cable station and building out more uh, fiber infrastructure, kind of in that aforementioned first bubble broadband bu boom and bust. Um, and you know, as far back as 2000, people wanted to have access to these resources. They wanted to be able to, to benefit from being right next to this amazing resource. And um, in this example, as it kind of reads, the, the reason given was basically that, you know, it would be so expensive to build out a point of presence. I love the phrase like a special building, like such a condescending way to talk to people about the internet. Um, and you know, that it, the idea of kind of building out those, those, those things just for the town would be far too prohibitive. The thing that's weird about that is um, this is from like Mendocino County parcel like records. Um, they'd bought property in 1999 to build out a point of presence. Um, it's right here. Um, it's down the road from the cable station, um, and it's really terribly disguised. I mean, like, I don't know if they were going for, like, a house or a barn or a house barn, um, but, it's, you know, I think, again, with the, the shrubbery or trees as, like, obfuscation technique, it's not working that well. Um, but, you know, Level 3 is not really concerned with serving those like people in that area so much as they serve markets. I mean, they're not a provider who does, you know, home services and AT&T doesn't really have an incentive to improve services in there because they already kind of have a lock on like terrible local cable connections. Um, and so this sort of just persists. Like there, I, I talked to people in that area who until maybe like three years ago were still using dial up, um, which isn't to say that this is like a totally hopeless situation, right? Um, there have been a few efforts over the last couple of years um, in the area to kind of improve connectivity, most of them around wireless ISPs because setting up microwave antennas is far simpler and quicker than um, doing a, uh, a full new fiber trenching, even though you tend to have to still trench new fiber for a microwave network. Um, these are some antennas on the roof of Manchester Elementary School. Um, that are part of a network that started being built out about two years ago, I think, um, by an organization called Further Reach, um, who are really, I don't know, it's like, I find it kind of like heartwarming because a lot of the people who work for the organization um, are from the area. Um, there's one guy there, uh, Zon Moore, who like moved back to Point Arena specifically to work for this project, which emerged out of um, some work being done at a PhD program at UC Berkeley. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of kind of investment in trying to like expand this. They got very lucky that they were able to get a fiber link in the level three station through some shady maneuvering that I think I'm not supposed to talk about. Um, but anyway, uh, so these are a bunch of questions, some of which I imagine for this audience might seem a little facile, but that I think have just been bothering me through doing this kind of work um, that I kind of wanted to throw to the room and then go to the next presentations. And the first one is, you know, is infrastructural education politically useful? Um, because one of the things um, I run into when trying to talk about doing the curriculum development stuff is this mostly exists in sort of an after school setting, like it's, ex you know, kind of extra credit material. And in an ideal world, like I think this should just be taught in schools. Like this is just, this should just be knowledge that, that middle school-ish age kids probably is a good starting point, should just have. Um, but it's really unclear what subject matter you put it in because it's, it's not really computer science. Um, a lot of computer scientists I talk to don't know anything about physical infrastructure, which is really baffling. Um, it's not really history, even though we talk about history a lot in it. And in an ideal world, I think of it as kind of being a sort of civics, but, or social studies, you know, trying to understand the ways in which this, like the systems that make everyday life kind of work. Um, and I don't know, I, I kind of romantically hold on to this idea that, you know, knowing what makes things the way they are is kind of a, a valuable condition for kind of maintaining or pursuing the possibility that they could be otherwise. Um, but in the case of something like a submarine cable, otherwise is a really hard thing to imagine given the scale, you know, like the idea of a, of, you know, subverting the like large corporate consortium model for something that costly and massive is, is really hard to, to envision. Um, which is kind of a segue to the, the second question about sort of what we want to classify access to the network as. Is it a privilege, a necessity, or a right? And I feel like the, 
it's kind of a deceptively like banal question that I, is in some ways whatever you choose is drawing a line in the sand. Um, you know, because I think the, there's sort of a dichotomy between the rhetoric of what the internet can or is supposed to do and the reality of having a business model as a telecom. Like, if I were AT&T, hell no, I wouldn't be like providing internet to people in Point Arena. That's a huge waste of money, right? Um, but a good, it's a good thing I'm not a corporation because I have a soul. Um, but I, I guess, and, and simultaneously, like, there are a lot of people who actually move to those rural remote areas specifically to get away from the network, which in and of itself I think is actually being able to live at this moment without the internet is maybe a greater privilege um, than, than having it. Um, but the last thing I guess I wanted to kind of end with was just a question that I've been thinking about especially over the last two days is sort of who decides that something's invisible, right? Um, because for someone who lives in an area that has terrible connectivity, who can see all of these posts with like caution, buried fiber optic cable all around, who knows there's a cable that goes to Japan right down the road, like this stuff is pretty easy to see. You know, this is, this is not a, a hidden network. This is, these are lived effects. This is something that is kind of part of day-to-day -day life, um, especially actually in cases where um, apparently, in some cases, like when it rains, <laughs> some of the roads like, the, like will kind of like buckle and the cables will actually start to come out of the ground. And like when you're dealing with that as someone who drives on those roads every day, like that's not invisible. Um, and I, I worry a lot about the language that's put around these systems as being hidden or, you know, that no one cares. I don't know who that no one exactly is supposed to be. <laughs> um, and I worry that, that there's, there's something akin to um, the rhetoric of, I don't know, giving a voice to the voiceless. You know, everybody has a voice. You should probably just learn how to listen. Um, and I guess what I've been trying to do over the last year or so is learn how to look for perspectives that are not like my own. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the, the following talks because I sh I'm sure that they will provide that as well. Thank you. So uh, we go on to the next speaker. Thanks so much, Ingrid. It was uh, really uh, interesting to, to see this uh, localized project. Uh, so the next speaker, let me just get my papers, is uh, Aspesto, um, who is the co-founder of Radio Cybernet, uh, the first Italian streaming-only internet radio, the Freaknet Media Lab in Catania, the first Italian organization to offer free internet access to email and internet since 1994, and the free software Poetry Hack Lab in Palazzolo, uh, Acride in, si in Sicily, where he lives. And he is the director of MUSIF, and he is my Italian, maybe not so good, Museo dell'Informatica Funzionate, is that somewhat correct? A museum of working computers based in Palazzo, uh, which is both a physical and a virtual place where people can enjoy using historical computers, get to know their history and learn basics of uh, electronics and computer science. And the museum is supported by UNESCO, uh, I think that's really... Uh, great, and the Free Software Foundation. He is also the creator of the first wooden laptop in the world. <laughs> he wrote a book about Heiko, Cohen Send Stories and Other Things, and which was published by the Dine Org Foundation in Amsterdam. So Aspesto, thanks so much. Uh, looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, everybody. Uh, it's working, yes. Okay, uh, I will talk about the situation in Sicily because it's very funny. I started with this, it's a very funny image of a shark chewing a cable. And Sicily is beautiful as every of you know, but uh, has also a lot of problems that lie underground and uh, but let me introduce what we do in Sicily because we now are uh, a computer museum because we collect a lot of computers. Uh, when we started the, the, lab at, the, the lab in Catania many years ago, we started from trash. We found computer in trash. We, 
we put Linux and uh, create a network and let people use them on the internet for free and it was very funny and people uh, started bringing us old computers. Some of them are very old. Those computers were very old and so we just uh, started collecting those computers and the idea of a museum came out uh, many years ago and so we have now about 2,000 computers in, in a deposit and uh, some of them are uh, in a show and people can use it because we fix them, we, we try to put back to work and we are actually joined with another computer museum in Cosenza in south of Italy so we are kind of to uh, a single museum with two different locations. And the group is, is, is around the world because many of us had to, to emigrate to other country to find a decent job. So in Amsterdam, as he said, in, uh, maybe in Poland, in, uh, in some spaces, Spain, Mexico, Australia, France, uh, they are everywhere, we are everywhere. <laughs> And this is an exhibition in Cosenza of some of our computers and, uh, and this is our uh, part of our exhibition in Palazzola Crede, this little town in Sicily. Many people ask why a computer museum in Sicily? I don't know why. <laughs> and uh, yes, we, we are on our own uh, uh, we, we have no help from, uh, from nobody, from an institution, or nothing. We survive by donations and from, from trash, because we found stuff in the trash, and that's funny for us. And as, as I said, we, we try to fix and restore this computer because it's funny, because we want to use them, we, because we like video games, and people came to visit and play games on the computers, and it's, it's very funny. And also we, we work in, in save old hardware, sometimes it's very difficult, as you say, as, as you see here. And uh, we have this guy below came to help us because twelve of us can't uh, can't even uh, bring it. And he alone was passing this computer to us. We are uh, all these people uh, totally useless. <laughs> he he literally saved us. And restoration is what we do. This was in a, in a chicken farm. So it was really a mess. Uh, one week for cleaning it and uh, having back to work, it was terrible. But it's working, it's very nice. It's from the 80s, made in Italy. And the research is about uh, how those computers uh, survive in times so the plastics go goes yellow and the, and the breakdown the the electronic components also uh, explodes because they change chemically inside and uh, we have to face every day this kind of problems so we we have people bringing us computers oh okay i i i stored this computer very carefully for 20 years in my garage so it works and he turns on and the computer blow and every time we say, don't turn on the computer, please. <laughs> and also data, data recovery is an important part because we want to make this computer work again. So we need the operating system, we need the, the, the software. Because also software have the story of the computer inside. And as I said, Sicily is a very difficult place to live because this is a nice image of my, oh, my city, Syracuse, but we have also a lot of trash in which we found computers, so it's not so bad for us. But trash is literally everywhere, and, uh, and sometimes, okay, those are fridges and uh, boxes of asbestos, as you can see there. But sometimes we, we found a huge uh, amount of old computers in, uh, in, the, in the bushes, hide, hidden, and... Uh, we found really a lot of stuff. So this is why I started this blog called Fallout Sicilia. Fallout is a video game. I, I hope uh, you, you know this game. And I try, in this blog, I try to, to compare the Fallout uh, uh, panoramas to Sicilia panoramas I found some time. And it's a, it's a work in progress. I'm, I'm just playing the game and uh, trying to, to see how much is similar to the Sicily. And this is why I love this video game. 
Okay, this is the funny part. About the digital divide is a very long story dated a long time ago because we have uh, this company in Italy that was a monopolist. So I start very, very later in the 80s. This is only an example, the Videotel. Videotel is like the French Minitel. Different was, the difference was that Minitel was free and the Videotel was very expensive. So you have to buy the terminal, you have to buy an account, and every page you display for some uh, activities, you have to pay for. So you had maybe a, a search engine in Videotel that says, okay, if you go on, you have to pay five euros for page. It's just an example. And you say, okay, I need this information, so okay. You press enter and you go to a welcome banner, and it's five euros. And you press again, and welcome to this service, and this is another five euro, and so on. Please enter your search query, and you have to press enter. Is this another five euro? You enter the query, and it's very complicated, and you made an error, okay, five euro for the error page, and you go back to the welcome, another five euro, and so on. And this is how the video tell was working in Italy. It was very, and this is why we were hacking the Videotel accounts back in the 80s, because there's no way. And now an example of cable break. This is our main place in Palazzola Crede, another lab similar to the Catania lab we made for free for people, for kids to play with computers. We had a, an ADSL line there. And uh, it's, it's a building, we are in the first floor, and in the second floor, uh, a lady came to, to live, and he asked to the telephone company for the phone connection. So the, the cable guy came, and what he did, he break our connection, and jump, uh, and jump right to the lady connection. So from one day to another, we, we, were, we had no ideas line, that is, inside, and he cut the cable and he jumped uh, to the other line and uh, we left, uh, he left with no connection at all. So we had to open a, a ticket for a network connection problem, and the cable guy came again, the same, and, <laughs> and he made another jumper for our connection and he climbed about 20 meters on a building with a ladder with no security measures at all. And I made a picture of this. And here is the cable guy embraced to 380 volt cables, making a patch to our lines on another line of another people. Maybe he cut another line for, for us with tape taping the cables. And so I decided, OK, I want to see where my IDSL line goes. So I follow with the cable, you see the patches. I follow and another, other two patches here. So when it rains, uh, all this goes fucked up. I see the cable, the cable is tied to this air conditioning system. <laughs> <laughs> it goes to the ground, literally, and disappear inside here. And I went inside this, I, I had to put a suite on me and go inside the deep of this. This is in the city, actually. And I found this network. <laughs> this is the derivation box for my ADSL line. <laughs> and uh, that's the situation of connectivity in Sicily. It's very bad. And this is a derivation cable, uh, no, a derivation box. In the, in the town, as you see, plants are growing inside of it. This is very common. It's open, so everybody can open this and connect to the patch cables and maybe listing for phone calls or uh, I don't know. We were doing this in the 80s. But <laughs> and this is the inside of one of these connection boxes. So uh, water came inside, everything is oxidized. And uh, I have this story about a guy talking about another guy. It's not me. But this guy had a DSL and the telephone problems in the, in, the, in the city. 
And the telecom said, we can do nothing because everything is okay. So it start opening tickets and tickets and the telecom always say, we can do nothing. We, uh, and the, one day the cable guy said, we can do the work because it will cost too much to pass a new cable only for you. And uh, he did this. So he burned to ground the entire <laughs> derivation box cutting about 8,000 8, people, telephone connection and DSA, so the telecom, the telecom uh, guys had to rebuild everything just to, to fix one DSL line. This is how in Sicily they deal with problems. <laughs> it was very funny when I was here looking at this. <laughs> this is another situation very common. They, they put those boxes, those derivation boxes, on the, um, along the streets. But people park along the streets, and sometimes people go literally on these boxes. They throw it down, and we found also cables uh, chewed by animals, by rodents, mice, maybe. So it's really a problem, and uh, because I'm a gamer, all this influ is influenced by cable breaks. I'm a gamer, in, uh, 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 I choose this game because it's a game uh, uh, with many people in the world. We do a lot of, uh, how to say, uh, simulations. It's like uh, role-playing games. It's a hack of uh, uh, GTA San Andreas, but it's a multi-user one. So uh, we are about a lot of people doing stuff, uh, doing duties uh, and uh, making fun of this, and uh, just some pictures to, to show the game because it's very funny. There is people connecting from all the world, and uh, the situation is we, we, we make a lot of stuff together. We share, uh, um, it's role playing, so it's about acting and creating stories and having these stories going together. And I was in this game to, 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 to see and to study how the, the group from different countries, the behaviors of these groups, because they are gaming from Thailand, from Syria, from uh, maybe a, a lot of places, really, Lebanon and uh, Africa, Saudi Arabia, Belgium. This is a drug dealer search, for example. <laughs> and that's the problem, a gamer, uh, uh, is affected by cable problems and disconnection problems. So this is a, this is our a this line normally. It's very bad sometimes, and this means network trouble in in the video games. You will be freezed, and uh, the other game see you literally freezed in the game and can do whatever. And so they really can kill me, can stall my things, uh, it's, it's also funny. And the question is, guess who have the slowest internet connection in this game? Uh, Syria people, maybe because of the war, maybe from Libya, maybe Macedonia, Romania. No, it's the Italian guy. And they make a lot of jokes for me, <laughs> for this. And this is a nice chart about internet speed, and uh, there is no uh, description of Sicily, but it's about half, it's about four megabytes. We are really in a bad situation, and... Uh, and this is funny because we have about uh, 40, 50 megabytes on the cellular phone in Sicily, LTA, 4G uh, standards. I don't know exactly how they work, but I know that the 4G connection goes to the same telecom send, uh, derivation boxes at the end. So where, where this bandwidth come from? Why the DSL is so slow and so full of problems? And we have all these cellular phones go so fast. And this is just a selection of money the government is, has spent for breaking the digital device in Sicily. 140 millions in 2004, maybe five. 436 million in 
2015. And uh, this is talking about 13 billions of euro here, 71 million here, and another, another tranche of money. I don't know where this money is going, but this is what we spot. Rain, wind, power outages, every time the rain is going on, we, the line drop, sometimes the electricity drop. So the answer about the panel, if the weather can affect the cloud, I say yes, <laughs> it does. And this is a simple comparison about Ireland, because many of uh, people of our group is in Ireland now. They have a lot of bandwidth and a lot of data centers there. And uh, we, uh, we may think because they have a lot of connectivity, but I just had a stupid uh, sum of all these cable terabits. Those connections here around the, the island is 64 terabits total. But if I do the same for Sicily, it's 92 terabits with a lot of cable here. So why we don't have connectivity? They bounce. Uh, Every, in, in other direction? I don't know, really. This is the main question I have. Maybe I have to start going around to make pictures and search for manholes and so. And this is the situation of the network in Sicily. And uh, those are recent news from two days ago in Palermo. We had uh, some firestorms. Why I'm saying that? Because uh, fire doesn't happen for nothing, there is something, there, there is always a man starting the fire. And the satellite situation is really bad. And an entire uh, reserve, uh, reservation was burned to ground, also houses uh, of people and, uh, we had, and, and also line connection and uh, cell phone repeaters, infrastructure at all. This is from three days ago. And uh, we think uh, this was started by a shepherd just to clean the land to have new grass for the, come si dice, per le pecore, for the sheep. This is very common in Sicily. And this is why, <clears throat> this is another view. This is what I see in the future of the Sicily because it's going worse every time. And so I think finally my blog about Fallout Sicilia will have a sense. So thank you and uh, see you in Fallout. Thanks so much, Aspetto, for this insight into the situation in Sicily and, and the, the slapstick qualities of the, of the internet. Um, the, the next uh, speaker, last speaker on the panel, Helga Tawilsuri, who is an associate professor of media, culture and communication and the director of the Hagop Kewokian Center for Near Eastern S Studies at the New York University. She works on issues to do with technology, media culture, territory and politics in the Middle East, and especially Palestine-Israel. Her research includes text on Arab media, Palestine, Palestinian cinema, television, video games, and popular culture, on telecommunications and internet infrastructure, and development in the Palestine ter Palestinian territories. She's co-editor of the 2016 book, Gaza as, Gaza as Metaphor, and her monograph titled Digital Occupation is forthcoming. And then she's uh, co-edited volume on Arab uh, media and culture. Furthermore, she serves as an um, serves on a number of journal editorial boards and Middle Eastern nonprofit uh, foundations. Helga, I'm really glad you could come and join us for this panel. Uh, yeah. Um, this 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 ooh, yeah okay. Uh, the grass is always greener on the other side. Sicily sounds wonderful <laughs> compared, to, compared to Palestine. Yes. Um, so thank you, Tatiana, Claudia, Johan, ev all the organizers, Jakob as well. So like everybody else, I think over the last two days, I too am obsessed with the materiality uh, of the internet and sort of telecom more broadly. 
and I've been following, if you want, kind of hidden infrastructure as well for years, but really kind of trying to understand how the politics of things are built and why they're built in a certain way. And so if Trevor yesterday had us, uh, or was trying to find ways of the invisible, and Henrik kind of follows the documents to find the evidence, my starting point is really much more kind of people's everyday lives as they come up against infrastructural limitations. And in my own case, it's horrible. I think I'm older than the 45-year-old uh, network engineer. So maybe there's a connection in our age in terms of why the obsession uh, with this. So today what I want to do with you guys is to actually sort of somewhat virtually travel through specific spots uh, in Israel-Palestine. And we're going to zoom in on the politics of infrastructure in, a, in very particular places. And along this journey, we're going to touch on the politics of infrastructure, but really also the impossibilities of, uh, I'm going to actually talk a little bit about the phones as opposed to the internet, because most of us today certainly access the internet through phones. So I'm actually going to talk about the impossibilities of even just making a phone call, um, and then what the differences are on people's uh, access of telecoms, of mobile apps, of internet, new technologies, and so on. And by doing so, um, hopefully you'll see how the formations and negotiations of new kinds of borders actually emerge. So let me just tell you my argument from the onset. One is that digital networks, whether on, under, or above the ground, are not boundless and open, but are actually spaces of control, as we, I think, have already kind of heard in, uh, to, in the last two days. And two, that these are actually often very ter territorial, and that they can also function as politically defined borders, which is not usually how we talk about things like the openness of the internet and, and mobility and mobilities and mobile phones and stuff. So I'm not going to directly touch on issues of surveillance or invisible war, but as you will kind of gather from the talk, anything that elsewhere seems like a conspiracy theory in Israel-Palestine tends to actually be true. Um, and so we're going to start in uh, Ramallah, uh, which is like the sort of de facto capital city in the West Bank. Then we're going to move to uh, Migron, which is an illegal outpost uh, six kilometers directly away from Ramallah in the West Bank. Then we're going to go from Ramallah to Kalandia, which is a checkpoint five kilometers south. And then we'll brief briefly touch on Jerusalem, nine kilometers south of the checkpoint. So we're in a very narrow kind of uh, place. And each one of these spaces themselves symbolizes a different kind of territorial and political space, right? So you have a settler outpost, you have a Palestinian city, you have a checkpoint, and then you have the undivided capital, right? And through them, we'll try to sort of understand a little bit of the technology infrastructures and how they literally mark and make the land, right? So my objective is not just to highlight how telecommunications is restricted, although that's part of it as well, but is to actually show you how telecommunication infrastructures are terraformers, right? Uh, so they're expressions of historical spatial processes that are very much territorial. So we're going to start with Ramallah. Uh, the, the sort of quasi-capital city of the Palestinian uh, territories and an overview, overview of Palestinian infrastructure. So the Israeli-Palestinian technological relationship, somewhat like their political and economic relationship, has largely been one of Israeli control and restrictions and Palestinian dependence on Israel. So from the outset of occupation in 1967, Israel controlled and maintained telecom systems in the occupied territories and then imposed very strict legal and military restrictions on the Palestinians, which would eventually kind of determine the kind of lands or like infrastructure that we have today. So in short, there was no such thing as a Palestinian infrastructure, right? There were no cables, there was no wiring, there was nothing kind of going on, except for things that had existed sort of before 1948 and even that was sort of ancient, right? Uh, and there was a gamut of limitations that were imposed on Palestinian technological use. So all the telephone switching codes, for ex or nodes, for example, were built from 48 and 67 onwards, were built outside of areas that would eventually maybe be handed over to Palestinian control. So a call between Ramallah and Nablus, for example, is connected through the Israeli city of Afula. Okay? And so it's the same 
for everywhere within the West Bank or the Gaza Strip. Things like fax machines were not allowed, modems were not allowed, you know, all, all sorts of things were kind of not allowed. By the time, uh, by the early 1990s, less than 2% of Palestinians had telephone lines. So suffice it to say, in the sort of very brief historical kind of uh, overview, that Palestinians were largely disconnected from the network and they lived under a regime that restricted both their mobility and their access to the outside world. And so the 1993-95 peace agreements reversed some of these restrictions and a Palestinian telco company, Paltel, was born in 1994, along with a subsidiary cellular provider called Jawal. And for the most part, Pal I mean, Paltel is a monopoly, uh, so all internet service providers are actually really just part of Paltel. There is today one other cellular provider, but it's uh, not doing so well. In any case, the peace agreements went on to stipulate the conditions of how an independent Palestinian telecom system would actually be constrained and bordered, in a sense, forever. And it was a sort of very clever play of new, uh, something like, if, if you read the document, something like new equipment cannot be operational until the network is independent, right? So sort of as catch-22, well, you can't be independent until you're operational, but you can't be operational until you're independent, right? So as with other infrastructures, whether it was sewage or broadcasting or water or all sorts of other things, Palestinians would be subjected to Israeli constraints that countered the possibility to build a separate and independent system. And so infrastructure building, development, and control would exist with uh, Israeli-imposed limitations, and to begin with, over land and territory. So just as the geographies of the Gaza Strip and the West Bank were contained during the Oslo peace years, so was infrastructure. And so this is a map of what the uh, cellular and landline infrastructure looks like in the West Bank, and it's a little bit confusing. But basically, each one of the red outlines is the space in which Palestinians are permitted to build infrastructure. So everything that is outside of a red line is not accessible to Palestinians, okay? Um, so ca Palestinian infrastructure continues to be permitted and, ac and accessed and maintained only in the Oslo-defined areas A and B, which are inside of these red lines, which is about 10, 10 and 40% of the West Bank, respectively. So what that translates into is, a, is the building of a fragmented and contained telecom network that has to physically circumvent 60% of the West Bank, and then in, in the case of Gaza, about 40% of Gaza. So there's no service, no Palestinian service, in any of what we call Area C, which is where there's none of the red stuff, right? Um, which are mostly either small Palestinian towns and villages, rural areas, but also Israeli-defined buffer zones, military areas, settlements, bypass roads, checkpoints, the wall, and so on. So here we're kind of zooming in a little bit so you can kind of tell where infrastructure is permitted to be built. So if, if up there you have, uh, on the top left, you have Ramallah. So you can kind of see the sort of circle around Ramallah where infrastructure is built. And each one of those green dots, I don't know if you can see the green dots, each, each green dot is an actual cell phone tower, okay? Um, and so besides the territorial limitations, all kinds of realities also limit Palestinian infrastructure. So there's too many to detail, but I'll, I'll list a few. So all international calls until today, whether incoming or outgoing, have to be routed through Israeli providers because Paltel is not permitted its own international gateway. All Gaza West Bank calls, obviously, are also switched inside Israel because Paltel hasn't been uh, given permission to dig under Israeli land, nor has been allocated enough spectrum uh, to use microwave technologies. Calls within the West Bank and within the Gaza Strip are also frequently routed through Israel, just as they were uh, 40 years ago. All, phone, all of these phone calls are also double billed because the Israeli providers then charge what they call termination charges to the Palestinian providers. So these phone calls also kind of cost quite a bit of money uh, for uh, the Palestinians. The network operates, the cell phone network operates on technologies that are more than 15 years old at this point. 2G is not permitted, let alone 3G, let alone 4G, let alone whatever's gonna come next, right? So Sicily is beautiful. 
Um, so which means that new mobile services like financial applications, PayPal, online banking, and anything GPS are non-existent, so it doesn't exist. And so in terms of surveillance, if it's not kind of already obvious in the way that the telecom structure is built, the entirety of the system is essentially under Israeli surveillance. So there's no conspiracy theory again, uh, and it's well before kind of Snowden sort of exposes these things, okay? So the Israeli Ministry of Communication determines the spectrum allocation and frequency the height and location of towers, the direction of the signals, what kinds of equipment is allowed, like what kinds of antennas, what kinds of base stations, what kind of subswitches, and so on. It also controls the area codes, it controls roaming and switching agreements. And this is just a chart that, sh that actually compares, and it's not a joke, it's actually, it's real. So this compares how much frequency the Israeli providers have compared to how much frequency the Palestinian providers have, right? So the Palestinians are basically operating on a, on a very, very narrow, if you will, um, frequency permission. And so the same is for the internet, the kinds of, uh, the kinds of limitations that exist for cell, so for cell phones or for land also exist for internet. So there's no internet tr trunk switching system. Internet traffic is also routed through uh, through places outside of the uh, Israeli territory or outside of the Palestinian territories. No Palestinian user is allowed to have a connection faster than two megabits per second. So again, Sicily is like, wow, four, that's amazing. Uh, encryption is not allowed and so on, right? So a contradiction begins to emerge here about high-tech borders and to what extent they ought to follow or trespass kind of territorial borders and for whom. And so the spaces of communication landlines, cellular, internet, and so on, and the infrastructures for Palestinians tend to follow Israeli-imposed territorial boundaries. So here, for example, you see the infrastructure of a settlement right outside of Ramallah, right? So you can actually see the towers, you can see the broadcasting stations, and so on. And so the boundaries that exist are really there just for Palestinians, because Israeli infrastructure and networks and signals are certainly in relation to the Palestinian ones unfettered or unbounded, which brings us then to our next stop in our journey, which is the outpost of Migron. Uh, in the fall of 2000, an Israeli cell phone company illegally installs a transmission tower on a hill six, six kilometers directly east of Ramallah, and in line of sight, so you can actually see Ramallah from here. The company then pressures the Israeli government to install electricity lines so that they can power the cell phone tower. It doesn't take long after that for a group of Jewish Israeli settlers to hook up five caravans to the electricity network and make the hill their home, disregarding the fact that the land actually, even according to Israeli law, belonged to a Palestinian family less than 500 meters away. A few months later, the Israeli Ministry of Construction paves a dirt road and installs streetlights. By March 2001, so about six months later, the Israeli military comes to guard the illegal settlers 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So 10 years later, the Migron outpost has electrified fences, is lined with, uh, has guard dogs, has surveillance cameras, has a gate manned by the military. This is kind of what it looks like, um, or what it looked like, rather, and was home to about 45 families or 120 uh, individuals. And so inside the fence stood the towers beaming cellular signals to Migron's residents, but also to nearby settlements, to those driving along Highway 60, which is a bypass road that is off limits to Palestinians, but also to Ramallah, because it's not that far away. So the story of Migron is actually significant, because something as seemingly benign as a cellular tower serves as the roots for territorial colonization. But the towers also mark a particular kind of land grab of a digital occupation process that combines the territorial and the high-tech control of highlighting the paradoxes of these uneven kinds of borders in the landscape of technology infrastructure. Cellular signals by their nature don't know to stop at a political boundary, right? So given Migron's location, the, si the signals are available in Ramallah, right? Or, and other sort of Palestinian areas nearby. These, of course, must be paid for, even though they are illegal by Israeli, Palestinian, and Oslo Accord standards. I don't want to get into the sort of details of the legalities, but if there's questions, I'm happy to answer. So there are four Israeli cellular providers across Israel-Palestine. They all operate in the occupied territories so that they provide service to settlers, to Israelis traveling on bypass roads, and of course, to the military. 
before companies generally have the liberty to install their equipment wherever they want. They boast 2,000 times more frequency spectrum than the Palestinian providers. They enjoy the latest technologies, the, late, the, the best internet speeds, and so on. And so Israeli cellular flows more or less follow Israel's territorial presence in the West Bank, in settlements, around settlements, on roads, and so on. And so a large amount of Palestinians actually use Israeli cellular signals since they're stronger, more available, and they're also cheaper. But there is no connection actually between the area codes, right? So that you can't call a number from Migron to Ramallah because there are also different area codes, right? On a, or you can't call from a Palestinian network to an Israeli network. So at the same time that a lot of Palestinians basically buy a second phone so that it works in places where there is no Palestinian signal, Israeli providers kind of turn a blind eye to that profitability, right? And it's illegal because in a sense, the not in a sense, because the Israeli providers are not paying tax back to the Palestinian Authority for basically operating there, okay? It's a little bit confusing. So the discourse on cellular and mobile phones often suggests that mobile phones free us from spatial fixity and give rise to what might often be called a networked individualism. Yet in the Palestinian case, mobile phones are constrained by spatial fixities of the infrastructural materiality determined by Israeli interests. So what exists here are contingent and dynamic mobilities. The relative immobilities that are enforced on Palestinians or, or Palestinian tech flows must be seen in relation to the relative mobilities they create for Israelis. So what results is this uneven marked territory and spatiality. There's these trespassable internal borders, and I say internal because often we're talking about what's going on inside the West Bank, right? Uh, which result in the bounding and bordering of Palestinians. So in settlements and outposts, bypass roads, military installations, military defined buffer zones, locations along the wall, and so on, Israeli cell cellular signals beam very strong signals. So in other words, whether you're standing in Ramallah or in Nablus or the entirety of Area C, one can receive Israeli signals, which brings us to the heart of Area, or one of the hearts of Area C, which is the Kalandia checkpoint. So Area C makes up about 60% of the West Bank, okay? There's, again, there's like, some of it is settlements, some of it is villages, some of it is things like checkpoints. So Kalendia is the largest checkpoint. It's a transportation hub, really, more than just a checkpoint, where buses, taxis, and so on connect between different parts of the West Bank, so that if you're trying to go from uh, the northern part or the middle part of the West Bank to the southern West Bank, you have to go through Kalendia, as well as between the West Bank and Israel. So for years, there was simply no telephone service in and around Kalendia. Joel signals, so Joel is the Palestinian provider, was just too far away and not strong enough to reach the checkpoint. And besides the fact that Joel had no permission to build there because it was an Area C. And so only in the last few years have actually Israeli signals from nearby settlements become strong enough to reach the checkpoint. So given the various constraints that Palestinians face, especially in terms of physical and territorial mobility, some Palestinians have tried to be kind of very entrepreneurial about how to deal with this. So in 2010, for example, sorry, a text messaging service called Ezma, which is uh, traffic in Arabic, allowed cell phone users to sort of t uh, send and receive text messages to kind of share traffic conditions, like, oh, I'm stuck on this road, there's a you know checkpoint pop-up, there's a soldier here, there's a soldier, but it's all text messages, right? Uh, so, and you know, it's based on whomever sends s messages to anybody else, right? A couple of years later, a kind of Uber-inspired application called Wasilni, which means like, give me a ride, uh, was, uh, was launched also to kind of help people share cab rides, right? Like, I'm going to wherever, does somebody else want to go to wherever with me? A Facebook group launches in 2012 called Kalandia Conditions, which relies on members to kind of share their traffic experiences and the crossing of the checkpoint. And they share jokes, they share videos, they share a lot of, I don't know, curses, uh, all sorts of things, right, on the Facebook page. And so all of these, in a way, kind of demonstrate Palestinians' entrepreneurial spirit, and they reveal, of course, the wider diffusion of mobile technologies, and they speak to a desire for normalcy amongst Palestinians. And they're certainly examples of how to deal with Israeli controls. And so enter Jawel in 2014, again, Jawel being the uh, Palestinian cell company joins in the targeting, if you want to call it that, of this market. The market of people who are really immobilized by travel and who must still get through. And so it launches a service called Q, Q for Kalendia, 
for traffic at checkpoint updates. Now, Joelle's queue service is an outcome and a response, of course, to the fragmented space and attempts to deal with that reality of Palestinian mobility being stunted. But it also reveals a number of really interesting things behind the scenes. First, Q only works because there are Israeli signals at the checkpoint, not because Joel signals are available at, this, at the checkpoint. And this is because of an agreement that was made in 2007 between Joel and Orange, uh, one of the Israeli providers. But I think like Orange is all over the place, right? Like, I don't know. I think it's Dutch or British. I don't even know what it is, but Orange, right? And so Orange and Joel made an agreement that Joel could pay for and sell roaming privileges across Area C to Palestinians. Now remember, in return, Orange still doesn't pay taxes for it, right? So it's basically selling the right to a Palestinian company for Palestinian users to roam. And when you roam, I don't know if it's the same in Germany, you get extra charges, right? Because you're now on someone else's network. So Palestinians could now roam through Area C or in a place like a uh, checkpoint, right? Um, and so that's number one. Number two, the ability to actually text Q on your Joel phone or to check the Facebook page or use any of these other things actually speaks to the growth of settlements because it's only with the expansion of settlements nearby that the signals have actually been able to reach the checkpoint because it's not like the Israelis are going to go and build a cell tower in the checkpoint. But as the settlements grow, they build, song st or they build better towers, stronger signals, therefore you can now get signal inside the checkpoint. Third, ironically, each of these examples that I've given you, and Q in particular, kind of speaks to an obvious geographic need, and yet not a single one of them can actually provide you a map, right? Because another, I mean, in other countries, you don't have uh, these kinds of services, not just because you don't have checkpoints, but because you have GPS, you have TomTom, -tom, you have Waze, you have all sorts of other things to help you navigate your traffic. And so fourth, and finally, Joel and Orange, um, make profits on an aspect of life that is dependent on and made desperate by the occupation, the need to pass a checkpoint. So Joao's Q service actually demonstrates that telecom ends up depending on the very conditions of spatial enclosure that it is actually attempting to negate, right? So it only exists because of the checkpoint. So the checkpoint, of course, symbolizes a lot more than just simply like this problem of telecom. It's also kind of symbolic of the inaccessibility of the West Bank in this case to Jerusalem, which is where we're gonna take a quick trip to next. Um, one of the first things that the Palestinian Authority does in uh, the early 1990s when it becomes like the internationally recognized representative of the Palestinians is it submits an official request to the ITU, the International Telecom Union, for its own international dialing prefix. Like, what's Germany, 49 or something? Is it, yeah? 49. So the Palestinians want their own, okay? Israeli officials immediately go up in arms about this and say, quote, this is a strictly politically motivated and it lacks any genuine technical or otherwise objective justification. And the Israelis are actually right because the Palestinians didn't and still don't actually need their own area code. Regardless of that, and as it would later happen with things like .ps or Google Palestine or all sorts of other things, 970 is granted to the Palestinians and is established in 1999, but it is purely symbolic. So even though Palestine has awarded its own international code, Paltel continues to rely to route international calls through Israel. So really when you're trying to dial 970, you're actually dialing 972, which is Israel, right? So the multi-million dollar international gateway that Paltel bought back in 1999 is really just a wonderful, very expensive way of collecting dust, right? So that 970 is really just a symbolic gain. And so in no way is it indicative of an independent telecom infrastructure, neither on the international nor also on the local level. So local and city level area codes are determined by the Ministry of Communications, right? So the Israeli Ministry of Communications. And the MOI in Israel determines, and I don't know if it's the same in Germany, but it's not the same in the US, like each cell provider gets a different area code, right? Um, and each, and obviously each region gets a different area code, right? So Israeli operators determine, or Israeli MOI, uh, Ministry of Information, 
or of communication, sorry, um, controls the area codes and decides, you know, who gets what area code and so on and so forth, right? Israel, of course, is connected globally to the uh, underwater telegraph and telephone cables. They're direct part of the network. But Palestinians obviously have no such thing. And so as far as the telecom network is concerned, Palestine doesn't really exist, right? So to go back to the issue of area codes, like Haifa, for example, is 04, Gaza is 08, Jerusalem is 02 but so are all the settlements and the outposts. So Migron is also zero too, right? So here area codes actually represent the territorial rupture of Israel's reach beyond any, ter any political or, or territorial boundaries because it's incorporating all of the settlements no matter where they're uh, located with Jerusalem, right? And so area codes here reflect, uh, reflect a very political decision. Now at the same time, it's a little bit confusing because uh, all settlements in the West Bank and when those existed, those in the Gaza Strip, could only be accessed internationally through directly dialing 972, okay? I don't know what it's like in Germany, but like in the US you can't even dial 970 because it just doesn't exist, right? So some countries recognize 970, some countries don't, but regardless of whether you can or can't dial 970, it's still going through an Israeli provider, okay? So it be, even though 970 was mostly symbolic, it also ends up being a tool to limit Palestinian connections on another level, which is to the entire city of Jerusalem. Because if you're in the West Bank or if you're in the Gaza Strip, Jerusalem is under 972 and therefore is an international phone call, right? Um, and so Paltel would have to connect to all calls in Jerusalem as it would to any call to Israel or might as well be to China, right? It has to go through an Israeli network and it has to pay long distance uh, charges. So in other words, Jerusalem remains the inaccessible capital uh, for Palestinians kind of well outside their network. I'm almost done. So let me try to recap a uh, kind of confusing geography. You're in Ramallah. You pay uh, extra for your phone service that runs on 1.5G. It's slower. It operates kind of 1995, 1996 sort of technologies, okay? Most of the time you have no signals. You can't reach a lot of people on the outskirts of town or kind of anywhere from far from a cell tower. If you go towards the outskirts of town, you can get an Israeli signal for which you need an Israeli phone. Um, if you are in Jerusalem, you make, or if you're trying to call Jerusalem from Ramallah, you have to make an international phone call. So you may as well be billed for calling China as you are for calling uh, Jerusalem. And as the area of Jerusalem expands in terms of how Israel defines Jerusalem, uh, that area which is long distance is also kind of getting closer and closer to you, right? So what was 10 kilometers away is today six kilometers away, all right? If you are in Migron, and if you're a resident, for example, of Migron, you can't call Ramallah. There are no sort of ways to sort of do the two. Of course, it maybe doesn't really matter because it's not like settlers and Palestinians kind of call each other up. But if you're in Migron, you can call Tel Aviv, you can call Jerusalem, you can call everything else uh, as a local call, all right? If you're at a checkpoint, usually there's no signal, but you don't have GPS, there's no Google Maps, there's no ways, there's no all of that kind of stuff. You can sometimes get an Israeli signal. And before you enter the checkpoint, you can text a service on your Palestinian cell phone, which through a roaming agreement with the Israeli company will allow you to get a signal for which you have to pay extra. And we'll, you will get a text message about what the traffic conditions are actually like at the checkpoint. So as I hope I've demonstrated, Palestinian users and the infrastructure as a whole are territorially and otherwise bound by area codes, by landline infrastructure, by the kinds of equipment permitted, the range, strength, and direction of signals, among many other sort of policies. Technology infrastructure here demonstrates the ongoing importance of territoriality, I would say for Palestinians, for Israelis, but really also more generally and that Palestinian technology infrastructures are actually constrained by Israeli policies demonstrate the spatial reach of Israeli power well beyond any presumed political or territorial boundaries. So here territoriality is very much a product of social and material practices that are marked by these uneven kinds of developments. The technology infrastructure in Israel-Palestine is not a metaphor for the conflict, but it is actually the conflict in built form. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Helga, for, uh, for a fantastic presentation into the geopolitics of, of the internet. And I think this panel really is a, is a great way to end this uh, conference of, of bringing these uh, examples of how what, what happens to the internet when it gets on land and how it influences the way people live and uh, how societies are organized. And I think since this is the last panel, I think we can already now open up for discussions from the floor. I have some questions. Uh, of course, also to begin with, but but I think we should just start uh, opening up now. I think first a uh, question for you, Helga, is um, how much does this situation, um, how much is it debated in actual political discussions? Is it is it just uh, kind of a non-issue in political discussions, or is it really debated? It's actually very political, so I'll just give you two quick answers. One is that the Palestinian Authority, starting 2007, has uh, tried to crack down on the number of Palestinians who use Israeli phones, for example, right? Fully knowing that, well, you can't function otherwise, right? So most Palestinians have two phones, like the Palestinian one and then an Israeli one, right? But so the Palestinian Authority has been trying to crack down on no more Israeli phones, you can't buy them, you know, the stores can't sell you the, the time cards and the chips and so on anymore, right? So that's, and in part, is very political, right? I mean, it, it's a sort of response to whether well, or not paying taxes. It's this kind of nationalistic drive of you need to support your own, you know, telecom provider, not not the others, right? So that's one way in which it's political. The other way is a sort of different um, angle, which is the reason. So the if you if you think of the slide of like the limit of the frequency for the Palestinians, like how little frequency and spectrum allocation they have. Um, every time that the Palestinians, or the Palestinians have asked a number of times for more, right? And there's a sort of, there's supposed to be this agreement in the Oslo Accords that when there is a need, you will get more, but you have to apply for it, right? And so the, the, um, the cell phone network was built to sustain 120,000 subscribers. Today that network has 3 million subscribers, but on a network that was made for 120,000 people. So the calls are dropped. I mean, it's really shitty service, right? Um, and you have to pay extra. But so every time the Palestinians say, okay, well, we really need more spectrum, or we need, we need more allocation, the Israelis are like, okay, well, why don't you drop your charges in the International Court of Criminal Affairs or whatever it is, right? Why don't you drop this request in the UN to become a state? If you do that, we'll give you more spectrum, right? So it becomes a different kind of political tool. Um, a question for you, Aspesto. Um, I mean, the, the problem of low, interconnect, low internet speed must be a problem for other people in, in Sicily, is, is there any kind of other protests uh, like trying to, like businesses for instance might also suffer from this? Um, is, that, is that an all an issue or are you kind of the only warrior in the fight against better bandwidth in Sicily? Uh, no, there are no protests about this. They just accept this, uh, uh, they accept this as a, as a fact. This is why many people just emigrate from Sicily to seek job everywhere. There is no, they don't see any future there. So they, maybe they study at the university and they go away. Every, every, every guy talk about going away from Sicily and work everywhere. That's the problem. That's why we started trying to create something there. I don't know if we if, if we can well, go. Well, the people on. coming to your uh, to your place and, mm. and and learning about these things. What? Well, what kind of people are coming then to your uh, workshops and? Well, a any kind of people, from old old people, um, retired people, and uh, very youngsters, and uh, a lot of people, but. The perspective is always the same, to go away, to go in other places, to, to learn something and uh, emigrate. That's it. Simply because there is no job for people in Sicily. There is no, nothing technology related, a part of little spots. That's the situation. Yeah, it's, a, it's a dire situation for sure. Mm. Um, but connecting to what, what you were saying, Ingrid, is I think this, this question of, I, I guess you call it, 
cable literacy <laughs> or whatever you want, want to call it. I, I completely agree with you that this should be taught in schools and it's kind of like repeating this idea that programming should also be taught in school at, at some point. But, but I think what, what would be interesting with a, with a, with a class on, on deep cables would be like exactly where do you put it? Uh, what, what, what kind of curriculum? Should it be uh, pure technical? And I think the, the presentations we've had here today shows it should not be, it just should be basically political science maybe. This is where, uh, and I, I think thinking about this curriculum in, in the terms of political science would really be a, a, a huge step forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, although I, I think, um, like I was saying earlier, one of the things that's been really disconcerting to me about this stuff is like finding the number of people who kind of work as, as engineers who like don't really comprehend the network that they're like working with or in, you know. Um, you know, I've, I've, I know people who it's like they're teaching graduate students and I ask them to tell me how the internet works and they say elves, I think, you know. Um, and I don't know how to like, in some ways I think that's, that's a matter of like computer science education um, curriculum questions about sort of like what's considered mandatory or not. I mean, kind of back to, to the topics of, of surveillance, you know, like ethics is often an elective in these, in these spaces. Um, and that's also a problem. Like what, what kinds of knowledge are, are prioritized when we're talking about sort of understanding the internet or its systems um, is, is a really huge issue, I think, across the board. And I think thinking about it as like socio-technical by default as opposed to kind of as like a unique perspective is a really important angle to consider. I wonder, I, I think we should just, people should just uh, raise their hands if they want to ask questions, but I think, could you, s I mean, a lot of, of what this two days have been about has been about visualizing something that is, is unseen or made invisible for, for different reasons. And, and one thing you do in, uh, as an artist is that you, you visualize uh, structures. I, I wonder if you could say a little about maybe not your upcoming show, or if you want that, that would be great, but uh, some, how you work with this aesthetics of visualizations in, in, in your art or as, as an artist. I can, yeah, I mean, I could talk a little bit about um, one of the projects that, that I think was kind of to, that you mentioned kind of in the intro, the thing I worked on when I was at iBeam, which is um, basically a field guide to finding the internet on the street. I think, I, I'm not sure if I have a copy with me on me, but um, basically there's, there's a lot of things that, you know, we're seeing in a lot of the slide talks today, manholes, spray paint, flags that are really kind of nice, like little signifiers of the internet that um, are really readily accessible to the person who doesn't have the time, income, or inclination to go on the, the grandiose uh, road trip to find the internet. Um, and I actually, I mean, it kind of emerged, uh, the project itself kind of emerged out of people saying no to me because, like, I was nobody and I couldn't get them anything. Like, when you're just some artist who wants to see the internet, like, 60 Hudson doesn't care. <laughs> um, or maybe I was just talking to the wrong person. Um, but so the, the, the guide itself is sort of a, attempt to kind of like find a lot of the sort of like everyday signifiers of the network on the street and then use that as sort of a sideways way to introduce a lot of, you know, internet history and sort of politics and a lot of it becomes more about like which companies own the internet. Um, the idea of that being something that you could kind of like pull out of your pocket when you see something weird on the sidewalk was, was kind of important to me as a way of kind of opening up the, the visualizing away from merely sort of like the, the zoom, the super far zoomed out perspective that kind of makes it like meaningless and into something that's like part of your ordinary life. Question there's already, yeah, there's one in, in the back there. Uh, is there a microphone? <laughs> Does it work? All right. So when you started talking about the situation in Palestine, something clicked into my head that connected your three talks. Uh, when you hear that situation, you start thinking, why can't people just build their infrastructure there, right? I mean, it's their territory. Why can't they just connect to each other? I studied engineering, and I was amazed by the way all this infrastructure we rely upon. It's very centralized. And this is something the internet community tried to fight for a while, but then the, this battle kind of went 
undercover, so it's, it's perfect to kind of rediscover this button in this panel where we are talking what is under the surface. Much of the technology we use is centralized. Uh, and yeah, I wanted to throw this uh, idea to you. Uh, who is working on decentralized technology? It's a few communities that are working on that, but it's very challenging and very ambitious, very utopi utopian. For example, Bitcoin is kind of working in a decentralized way. Um, this is just a suggestion. There are a lot of ideas connected to this, and there are very few people who are actually hacking on this, and they don't have, they're not endorsed by big corporations which don't have actually an interest in decentralized technology. I've been working with projects for uh, information technology in Africa, and we have to use some technology which is totally different from what you use, also for programming, right? So you rely on Google, you rely on Facebook, you, and those are all centralized hubs. So uh, to turn this into a question, when I started this studying from the engineering point of view, I was amazed by how the centralized technology works very well, and I was amazed by a few attempts to try to break this schema. There were a few small communities who were trying to build a really decentralized internet so that, for example, in Palestine, you could set up your data center and you would just have your internet or in Sicily or wherever. And one of these crazy groups was actually your community, Asbesto, because you were trying this Net Netsukuku idea, which was totally crazy. Uh, so I think it would be nice to kind of mention it and how it ended. I think you probably surrendered because the challenge was too big. But yeah, how was the experience? and? And how is, what is going on now on this frontier? Because I think there are other communities that are keeping the, this research on, right? But I kind of, I'm not up to date. Yes, me, me too. Because I, I'm just, uh, uh, as I said to a friend, I just stuck in the 70s with old computers. So <laughs> Netsukuku was started many years ago as a joke. Uh, we were in a hack meeting in Torino and uh, we were totally drunk, and we were start talking uh, about uh, this crazy idea of a network made by broadcast packet shouting each other with a lot of uh, uh, shouting literally in the network, just talking each other. Uh, so a node don't connect to a node, but shout his information to every other node. So the, the network will be fill up, filled up of, of shit. And uh, when, uh, when a node receives a packet that is not interesting, it will bounce it again to each other. So <laughs> we were really <laughs> laughing about uh, this kind of network until one of uh, our guys, uh, Andrea Alpt, said, wow, we can do this and started coding this. So he made code and uh, after about two years he went out with something working like this. So he, he just invented a way to, to have a computer launch a, a probe in the network searching for other computers that use the same kind of network and when they found each other they exchange uh, an IP address and they link together, but maybe there are other computers using this network that link together also, so different routes, like star connection and uh, everything uh, changing as new nodes went on, and uh, the, the, the nice thing is that it was working. And so uh, this was a, an attempt to create this kind of decentralized network. It was called Netsukuku just because uh, there is a, it's an invented word and it's just uh, that one on Google search. <laughs> and uh, okay, uh, after this, uh, Andrea Alpt, uh, one of these guys who went to study mathematics, uh, had his own way and the project uh, w was uh, just uh, on the net. Uh, other groups joined together, there was a uh, he started coded in C, and it, there was an implementation in Python, and now is in a, in a weird language called Lua that I don't know at all. 
and uh, some guys say me that it's working and some people is trying to use it and it's there is still a community developing on this so that's it maybe it can be an idea we uh, andrea in the, his mathematical study has the, this uh, theoretical question about what happens when two large islands of nodes connect together maybe america and europe so a lot of IP nodes maybe can be the same. Who changes? Who have to change the, the network uh, addresses to avoid conflicts? And this is also a problem. I don't know if they solve this, but it's funny, it's, it's nice. And uh, we were wondering about uh, uh, creating wireless nodes with Netsukuku inside, uh, hidden in, uh, in boxes so you will throw on buildings and they open up and put on the antenna and start transmitting. Just, <laughs> we were talking about, we together with motorbikes in Catania launching nodes on abandoned places just to grow up the network. And that's the idea. I don't know, maybe it can be done, but I think the problem in Palestine is that Israeli control the, the air traffic and when they spot a signal, they, I think they go to see what's there. So that's the main problem. Yeah, so I wanted to connect with that because um, at this festival we had in Linz called Art Meets Radical Openness. There was actually a person from Israel, I don't know if you know him, he's called Yoav Lifshitz and he's doing actually exactly this workshop, trying to build up a, a wireless encrypted spot to provide connectivity and solve this problem of the cable breaks at the borders. And he will be here in Berlin at the um, International Pirate Conference, Pirate Party Conference, and uh, um, is the 23 and 24 of July. So actually he wrote me two days ago telling me to tell you Elga exactly that <laughs> because he was really interested in your presentation and wanted to announce to the people here that if they're interested in understanding how to fix these cable breaks uh, uh, in this uh, problematic of Israel-Palestine, then it's uh, possible also to follow what he's doing. And they call it as a public performance installation art based on wireless. So I suggest people, at least in Berlin, to check it out. Thank you, Tatiana. More, more questions from the audience? There's one way in the back, three, one, two, yeah. Thank you. Um, I have two questions. One is for um, asbestos. It's relating, um, or the first one is to asbestos. The amount of money um, that you quoted, there was like three or four different amounts in relation to the spend for infrastructure. Has there been any follow-up um, on what might have actually happened to that money? Because it's a huge amount and if you would have allocated that amount of resources to reducing the digital divide as you called it in Sicily, the problems would not be there. So what's your thoughts on that? Uh, I don't know about that money because uh, we have a long story of money uh, uh, put, put out money for project in Sicily and money disappearing and uh, this is the mafia problems you know and uh, so I really don't, don't know why infrastructure are, are not built at all. Maybe in those days they are passing new cables on the streets but they did this also 20 years ago with a project called uh, Socrate about fiber optics in Sicily and uh, it went abandoned. So I don't know, I don't have information about this. Maybe they are working on that, maybe they sometime will choose to use this money for other stuff. That's the situation, I really don't know. Okay, and there's nobody else in the country following it up, journalists or? Maybe yes, maybe yes. And, I um, hope so. Okay, good. And the second question I have then is for um, Helga. I was just wondering if there's any um, groups uh, within Palestine that are actually not, um, are using other parts of the spectrum that are maybe not allocated for mobile phones. So for example, some of the white space 
that might be available to circumnavigate some of the issues that they have? And if so, could you maybe speak a little bit about some of those practices? Um, I mean, I think there's very little to kind of go around, right? So even ambulances kind of have a hard time because it's just because of the limits on, on spectrum allocation. And so, you know, I think it's a, you kind of have to think of it as a twofold problem, one of which is maybe not unique because you have this in other parts of the world. But um, so coming up with clever kind of hacks, if you want to call them that, is in itself uh, a challenge because you can't, it's not up to you what kinds of equipment you can actually have, right? So you can't, you know, like you can't use microwave technologies. There's hardly any Wi-Fi. You know, so there's a limitation in terms of what is actually permitted in and out of the not country, but whatever, in and out of the territories, right? And so uh, that's one. And you have to also sort of put it into pr perspective of while there are, of course, uh, kind of, let's just say, sort of technologically progressive groups, most people are not necessarily sort of digitally literate, if I can call it that, right? Uh, and the tech kind of technologies that, you know, that are used are still kind of pretty old, right? So people's imaginations in terms of technology are also just sort of as far as 1999 or 2001 or something, right? Um, I mean, I think the biggest, the biggest successful hack, if you want to even call it that, that happened, and, and you'll see, as soon as I say it, you'll kind of understand why it was wrapped up in so much other politics, was a guy actually got a fiber, fiber opt, optic cable through one of the tunnels in Gaza, right? Like, there's a hack, right? But then we're talking about Gaza tunnels, right? So it's always sort of wrapped up in other kinds of politics as well. Um, so I think that there are a few groups that sort of try to get around things. I don't know in particular about like sort of spectrum allocation. What's also for me a little bit disheartening is that there's all sorts of uh, support for, um, for kind of technology and internet and different kinds of incubators and stuff. And they're all supported by, you know, things like the EU and they're all about building peace and, you know, and it's like, well, they don't really address the kind of undercurrent problems, right? So there's this great group of people in Gaza called Gaza Sky Geeks, right? And they're great. I mean, they're like, you know, hackers and they sort of do stuff, but that doesn't kind of get away with the problem that, well, there's only one way to actually have internet connection because the tunnel was eventually flooded, so that fiber optic cable is gone, right? But so there's only one way to connect to the internet in Gaza, and that goes through, uh, you know, Israel, right? So you can't get around that. And so to me, those are the bigger hacks that need to kind of be contended with, and they're in a way impossible, right? I mean, I think there's ideas about sort of, you know, balloons, and, and but again, it's like air control, right? Sea control, I mean, there's so much sort of control everywhere that it's really difficult to find these little uh, waves, if you will. There's a question over there. Um, first, I wanted to thank Helga for giving us that uh, visualization and, and an explanation of how, how horrible it could be. Um, and I tend to think, in general, about the, the uh, cybernetic culture that it is a colonial uh, force in our in our in our civilization, just about everywhere, and um, you know you've just demonstrated kind of the worst possible scenario, and um, I, I'm I'm just wondering if there's if there's some thinking to look at this from a, another perspective of like is are we going to fight for rights to be, to be disconnected in certain circumstances. And um, for, uh, it's kind of almost appealing to me to actually move to Sicily if the, if the internet connection remains so bad because maybe people will evolve some other way to be connected rather than being colonized by the uh, corporate technologies that are, that are being kind of laid down to control society. So, um, just wonder if you all would comment. Do you think that we need, in some circumstances, to fight for being disconnected? Um, so there's there are a couple of um, sort of uh, you know within within the West Bank. So it's not a very big geography, but kind of a couple of famous 
uh, activists, sort of digital activists who purposefully do not use the internet, right? Uh, in part, you know, I mean, they're sort of, they're Marxists, but they're also like anti-colonialists, anti-everything, you know, whatever, right? Um, they belong in Kreuzberg, right? Anyways, um, they, uh, they refuse to go on the internet for, you know, and the reasons are sort of twofold. One is because, well, we know everything that we do on the internet is sort of being surveyed by Israel, and so if we want to do anything, we just got to get off the internet. But they're also very adamant about corporate surveillance, right? So they just don't see why they should do things on Facebook, for example, and they're very sort of anti-Facebook, anti-Google, anti-all of these sorts of things. So there's a, there are a few people, but they're a minority, who are like, you know, no internet whatsoever, right? That is just not the way that we do any kind of activism of any kind. Yeah, yeah, about the Sicily, this is not happening because they, all, uh, they always have a cell phone. So the cell phone network is working, so they are all on Facebook and Twitter and so. And uh, I am the wrong person to ask this because I live in the internet, so I am the guy who chooses to sleep into a data center because of the sounds. <laughs> so <laughs> that's it. And I, I, it's not happening about uh, this because I was talking about the land lines are very bad. Uh, the cellular lines are uh, skyrocketing. Since it, it seems so difficult that we will ever have independently owned networks in a, in a global scale because the cost of doing mm -hmm. transatlantic cables or whatnot seems like only corporate partnerships could, yeah. could achieve that, that maybe you know, things like Freifunk are maybe optimistic because you can connect a municipality, yes. but globally we're fucked. We, we tried this in, in local. Yeah. Also in, in the little town we have uh, some wireless network some ADSL line join it together in the same uh, IP class. So but the basic idea was if my ADSL go down, I can change the gateway just for surviving the connectivity. But no, I, I, I don't know if we can do this in a, on a large scale because we don't own the long line connection. So I'll be devil's advocate for a minute, right? I mean, I tend to agree with you, we're fucked, right? But I'll just sort of argue against it for a minute. I think one of the things that's come up, I think in the previous uh, panel, like when Andrew was talking, is actually, you know, we're all talking about infrastructure. We're talking about the cables. We're not talking so much about the content of what's going on, right? I mean, I come from the world of media studies. Most people actually do like the text and the, the, vis the visual and what's going on on TV and what does it mean and all of that. I'm like one of the few, not the few, I mean, I think we're sort of like a growing number who is like, I don't really care what the messages are. I want to know what's going on under the surface, right? But so I think the question can kind of be almost sort of flipped in that, well, sure, um, it costs billions of dollars to lay cables. It's a centralized kind of, you know, not centralized, but it's a, whatever, quasi-monopolistic, you know, uh, sort of enterprise. Not everybody can afford to do it. It's not like we're going to go lay our own cables and so on and so forth. And in the case of the Palestinians, you're sort of limited as to what kinds of technologies you have. But that doesn't mean that you're limited in the kinds of messages and the content that you actually create, right? And so, yeah, sure, you have to pay, right? And you have to sort of be uh, part of the system in that sense, but what you choose to do with it maybe is a little different. It's over optimistic, but. And I think also, I don't, with at least with the case of kind of undersea cables, I, I, to a large extent, this is sort of a matter of the same as it ever was, you know? It's not as though there was, there was a heady time when like we had cooperatively owned submarine cables running across the Atlantic and everyone had a vote. Like they always kind of had a degree of being tied to centralized powers. Um, Although, just for kind of like cute anecdotal things, and if anyone knows more about this uh, story, please uh, speak up. I did see kind of a bit of a really interesting piece about um, illegal telecom lines running throughout Lebanon recently. Um, there's a lot of kind of like secondary utility markets in that, that country, and there was a cable running from uh, Lebanon to Cyprus, and nobody knows how it got there, and nobody knows who's running it, um, which is just, really kind of unexpected. Um, we tried in Catania. You tried? 
we tried something in Catania, oh. opening, throwing cables, and, and we tried this just something for fun in Catania to create a landline under under the streets. Is Catania a landing spot? Is it Catania? The landing spot for the? Oh yeah, yeah. It's Catania. Okay. Yes. There was one more question over here. Going to the, the same direction as the um, like do-it-yourself decentralized uh, networking stuff, and yeah, I was going to mention the the German Freifunk community, and the, I, I think it's a worldwide movement. But um, yeah, usually the the wireless uh, LAN frequencies aren't that uh, strictly regulated as other frequencies. And I just wanted to ask if there were any uh, experiments or actually um, working implementations of uh, wireless LAN used to um, set up uh, local infrastructure in, in Palestine? Um, there's very little, right? Uh, it's a fascinating, you know, I'm thinking of Henrik and his obsession with following particular kinds of documents. I think my obsession was really reading the Oslo Accords, right, which is the peace agreements between the Palestinian Authority and, the, and, and Israel. And it's amazing the level of detail, right, like how high the tower can be, where it can be located, right? What kind of spectrum uh, police forces can use? What kind of spectrum TV signals can use? Where the TV signals can be sent from? I mean, every, not, you know, I mean, maybe it could get a little more particular, like in, down to the tenth of a meter instead of, you know, here's a hundred meter range of where you can install your tower. But so it's fascinating to sort of think about the level of detail and foresight that was kind of uh, done, right? You can also kind of blame the Palestinians because they signed the agreement. It's not like they didn't sign it, right? Uh, but I don't think they knew what the hell they were doing, to be honest, right? But so, in a sense, they kind of inherit this, this you know, extremely kind of uh, detailed uh, set of limitations. And I think there are a few kind of emerging uh, bodies that are trying to sort of do different things, but it's still, I think that it's, um, it's still kind of um, way, I don't know, way behind in, in many ways. And then, sorry, I just thought of, a, a, you know, your first question was, is it political? You know, I think it was Obama who came to Israel-Palestine maybe two years ago or something, and he was going to go visit Ramallah, and so all these groups post, uh, like, made uh, billboards or posters all over the city saying, Obama, don't bring your 3G phone. Obama, don't bring your 3G phone. So it's all over the place. Great anecdote. Any more questions? Then I will s say thank you, Helke. Thank you, Espesto. Thank you, Ingrid, for these amazing uh, presentations. I <laughs> and and thanks to the uh, audience for coming. But but I will have to uh, introduce. That those who made this all possible, this amazing uh, conference, Tatana Pazikeli and Daniela, to say a few uh, words. Yes, because as we usually, first of all, thanks a lot to all of you. <laughs> and as we usually want to do at the end of each conference of the Disruption Network Club, we introduce the next topic. But since uh, the next conference uh, won't be mainly curated by me, but actually mainly or basically the 95 percent by <laughs> Daniela. I would like to invite her on stage to tell us about that. And then I also will say some other little practical words of about what is happening after this night. Uh, so don't go away immediately. Thank you. Does it work? Does it work? Yeah. Okay, um, the next topic of the next event that will take place uh, on the 30th of September and 1st of October is actually ignorance, which is um, a topic uh, or a concept that uh, I was inspired to research more, also mainly due to the experience that I had with Tatiana and many of the issues and topics that we were discussing and um, addressing here in the last year in the many events that we had. and. Um, it will be um, in, the, in the context of the art and evidence topic that we have this year, it will be the um, 
kind of uh, connecting element between the first and the third event, topic-wise. And um, yeah, so now in the last two or today and, and yesterday we heard a lot uh, about ignorance in terms of um, classification and secrecy as one uh, major source and, and form of ignorance. Um, and then in September we will talk or we will broaden up, let's say, the scale or we will look at a much broader scale of possible forms and, and reasons for ignorance as somehow the, the other side of the coin or the dark side of, of our knowledge society. And um, yeah, the, the study of ignorance as a, as a yeah, broader field has become a tr inter, uh, transdisciplinary or interdisciplinary field of research that also somebody might know under the term uh, agnotology, which was coined by a historian of science uh, with the name Robert Proctor at Stanford University. He wrote um, a book a couple of years ago where he started, let's say, to collect all these kind of different issues that are connected to ignorance. And so, um, yeah, we will try to actually have a look at, at this whole spectrum and um, and uh, um, which includes for example ignorance um, through media neglect or media bias and secrecy but also um, selection or inattention or forgetfulness for example but um, may maybe what we will focus most uh, on will be um, suppression and um, strategies developed by big PR uh, uh, companies and think tanks and corporations that um, intentionally want to manufacture doubt and ignorance. So, um, yeah, to in order to uh, keep up or create actually c uh, controversies and um, and doubt to uh, prevent policymakers from taking action against um, certain products or certain uh, developments that might yeah, damage the, the, the business of these corporations. We cannot say too much now. <laughs> okay. Then I'll... Sorry, we come to the okay. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, it's... it's <laughs> no, um, yeah, we will have a series of scholars and, and researchers and um, artists that, research, uh, that work on this topic. And um, just to give a little bit more information <laughs> on the two great people that will come and that are confirmed so I can easily say the names. One is uh, Matthias Groß who will give one keynote. He's a German social scientist and uh, science studies scholar at the University of Vienna and the Helmut Center for Environmental Research in Leipzig. And he just, um, last year he co-edited uh, a huge publication, uh, the Routledge International Handbook of Inter uh, Ign Ignorance Studies. So he will give um, an overview of the whole field. And later on, we will also have, for example, Joanna Kempner, who is a sociolo so 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 sociologist working on the intersection of science, medicine, gender, and the body. And she will talk about um, the production of forbidden knowledge and public controversy. And yeah, so I, I gave, gave obviously enough <laughs> information <laughs> and I hope just enough to make you all come back and um, yeah, be with us again in September and October. Yes, thank you. And uh, thanks a lot. <laughs> and just I want to conclude with something uh, fun. Uh, since uh, our events will also have a pre-event uh, like we always do will be two weeks before that and uh, is done in cooperation with the spectrum project space and this night they are celebrating one year of activity so i invite all of you to go there after this conference there will be a lot of great performances and the space is really close to here is in burkenstrasse so i mean i just invite you to go there and uh, celebrate with them uh, their activity and I want to conclude uh, not only thanking uh, Daniela Silvestrin, Claudia Dorfmuller, and Kim Foss of the Disruption Lab, but also our great uh, team. Now I want to say a bit of name. Uh, Jonas Franke, our supersonic uh, psychedelic uh, graphic that did a lot of uh, red uh, 
and the black uh, tubes that made us uh, really dizzy all the time, but <laughs> it was really beautiful. And um, our photographer, Maria Silvano, they're also film that have been filming uh, all the time, all our talks. And uh, the technical team with Elle, Paolo, and also uh, Gabriel that help us a lot with the microphones. And uh, yes, so that I think it's enough. And <laughs> thanks a lot, everybody. And uh, if you want to study more and see again what uh, we said, um, we will have the videos online in uh, some time, not so much, I guess, some days. So thanks a lot again, and thank you for being here.